This is a circle to the power of a circle. It's an intriguing shape that loops around on itself, and it's interesting at any scale. There's something going on no matter how far we zoom in or how far we zoom out. And there's a fascinating way we can make this graph three-dimensional. But before we get to that, let's first see how the two-dimensional graph is created and what it even means. I think shapes are a great way to visualize complex numbers. In recent videos, we've explored putting a shape into a function and combining different shapes together. And this naturally led to the question, what if we take a shape to the power of a shape? So how do we do this? Each shape is a set of complex numbers. This circle is all the numbers x plus y i where x squared plus y squared equals 1. So if we want to take a circle to the power of a circle, we can take each of these numbers to the power of itself and then graph the output. We'll do this for every point on the circle. But what are the outputs? How do we take a complex power? It helps to write this number differently. Instead of using a grid with a horizontal x and a vertical y, we can use polar coordinates with a radius r and angle theta. The number is equal to r times e to the power of i theta. So going back to this problem, we can rewrite that base using polar coordinates. The radius of the circle is 1, so that radius goes away. And then we can distribute the x plus y i. And now we're left with a real part and an imaginary part. So let's split those e to the power of a real number is a positive real number, so this becomes the new radius. And then we have e to the i theta x, so theta x is the new angle. And that's it. We can use this formula for those points on the circle. Let's try it out. Here is a circle to the power of a circle. Okay, this is kind of cool, but why is there a corner? The input was a circle, so the output should be smooth. And it is smooth, we're just not seeing the full picture. To get here, we start with this point on the circle, then draw around until we get back to where we started. But if we keep going, if we do a second lap around the circle, it makes a new path. The output from the second lap is different from the first. Why? Let's recall the polar form for a number, r times e to the i theta. After a lap, we get back to the same number, but the angle has increased by 2 pi. So a change in 2 pi doesn't change the number. But now recall the form for a number to its own power. Adding 2 pi could change the output depending on what x and y are. If x is a half, this will add pi to the resulting angle, taking it halfway around the circle. So an extra lap has moved the point. The choice of angle matters. To get the full answer of a circle to the power of a circle, we can't just look at angles 0 to 2 pi, or 2 pi to 4 pi, or any other single lap. We should look at all angles, from negative to positive infinity. So let's start at zero radians and graph outward in both the positive and negative directions. They're symmetrical, since complex numbers have horizontal symmetry. Here, the numbers grow to a radius of about a hundred, and then they shrink down to about a thousandth, and then grow again, this time getting even larger, and then they shrink again, this time getting even smaller. With each successive lap around the circle, those extremes get more and more extreme, and I'm starting to get nauseous. Let's just show the first lap in blue, and then the next in pink, and the third in yellow. This view also shows us that each successive lap gets more extreme. The yellow gets much closer to zero, and much further from zero. What else can we learn? Let's label some points. First, the outputs of 1. It's just 1. 1 to the 1 is always 1. This is unfun, and we've only just begun. When it's reversed, it's no more diverse. 
Fixed points are the worst. I wish they'd disperse. Perhaps we should try another input nearby. So next we'll apply this function to the square root of negative 1. Some of the outputs are close to 0, and some are very far. But we notice they're all on the real axis. What's going on there? i has radius 1, and on the first lap it has angle pi over 2. So to calculate i to the i, we can replace the base with polar form, and then multiply, and we're left with e to the negative pi over 2, which is about 0.2. But on the second lap, it has angle 5 pi over 2, which gives a result of e to the negative 5 pi over 2, about 0 0.0004. And the next lap gives a result of about, oh, that's a lot of zeros. Each lap we multiply by e to the negative 2 pi, about 1 over 535. So in the positive direction, the numbers get smaller by this factor, and in the negative direction, they get larger. And going back to the graph, we see that these outputs of i are near the extremes. This output is about as close as the blue lap gets to zero, and then again with the pink lap, and again with the yellow. Interesting. Let's focus on just the path from 1 to i on each lap, the first quarter of the circle. Blue goes up and down a hill. Pink takes a much shallower hill, then loops around the origin. And yellow takes an even shallower hill, and then does two loops around the origin. How can we explain these hills and loops? Let's go back to this equation. The angle of the output is theta x. The x, or real value, of a point on the circle is the cosine of theta. So we can replace that here to get theta times the cosine of theta. And this is the graph of that function. Let's limit the graph to just that first quarter of the circle. This is the first lap. The angle just makes a hill. On the second, we start at 2 pi, increase a bit, then drop down to 0. On the third, we start at 4 pi, then drop down to 0. And this pattern continues. Each successive lap starts 2 pi higher, so it will take an extra loop to return to zero. So that explains the loops, but why does the radius approach zero as we do the loops? Let's look at the radius in this equation. Y can be rewritten as the sine of theta, giving us this expression. Let's graph just that exponent. It looks similar to the earlier graph. Now let's limit to the first quarter of the circle. Each lap we start at zero and then drop into the negatives, getting further each time. So if we take e to this power, each lap starts at one and then drops down closer and closer to zero each time. And that explains why we always start at the same point, then get closer to zero. So now we have a pretty good sense of the first quarter of the circle, and we could also study the second, third, and fourth, but the reasoning and results are very similar and it's time for us to move on and take this graph into the third dimension. We're currently using color to distinguish the different laps, but we could instead use a new dimension, an angle dimension. Let's do this first with the input shape, the circle. In two dimensions, we just draw around the circle as the angle increases. But in three dimensions, we also move along in the angle dimension, which gives a spiral. Here is the origin, and the first lap in each direction, then the next, and the next. This 3D view makes it clear that we're taking six laps around the circle. We can't really see that in 2D. Here is the graph of a circle to the power of a circle. It does a great job of showing that as we get further from the origin, the extremes get larger. And now that we have this new dimension, we don't need to color by lap anymore. So let's change to this scheme, blue for inputs near i, and pink for negative i. So we see in the positive angles on the right, the radius is largest near negative i, but in the negative angles on the left, it's largest near positive i. And we also see the phenomenon of more looping further from the origin. These wiggles near the minimums get smaller and more numerous. 
But we can only see these wiggles because I've played a trick on you. Instead of using the true radius of the outputs, I'm graphing the fifth root of the radius. This helps us see the small scale and the large scale at the same time. This is the true graph. At a small scale, it's hard to see what's going on, and at a large scale, it's basically two-dimensional. So I think this adjusted graph is much better to see the full picture. It flattens out those extremes. And now I'm sure you're getting bored of just circles, so let's try some other shapes. Here is a pentagon to the power of a triangle. It's pointier, but it doesn't look that much different. We get the same general phenomena that we saw with the circles. And here's a square to a hexagon. Again, it looks quite similar. By using a polygon instead of a circle, we've essentially just changed the radii of the points. But the effect of the radius is overshadowed by the effect of the angle, since that angle is an exponent. So let's play around with the angle instead. When taking a circle to the power of a circle, we took each point to the power of itself. But we could take different points. So if the base has some angle theta, we can take the exponent to have angle 2 theta. The maximums happen twice as often. But we don't have to use 2. What if we change that scalar? When it's 0, the exponent is just 1, so we get that basic spiral. And if we increase, a maximum appears, then another, and another, and this continues. We could also throw in another variable, one that adds to the angle. This pushes those maximums towards and away from the origin. And while we're at it, why not use functions for the radius too? This one makes the graph even more wiggly. And you can play around with this yourself. This sketch is linked in the description. These four lines of code determine the functions for the radius and angle of the base and exponent. There's an x and y factor based on the mouse position, which makes this really fun. You can interact in real time to see how changing those inputs changes the graph. And there's also a time factor, so things can move by themselves. I've also made a two-dimensional version, since there's a lot of fun to be had here as well. That's all I have to share, so thank you for watching, go try it out, and I'll see you in the next video.